The United States prides itself on being a nation of immigrants, right? That's part of our concept of ourselves. And certainly in New York City, with the Statue of Liberty just down the road, it, this is part of our culture in New York City, that we are a city of immigrants, a nation of immigrants, the gateway to America through Ellis Island, et cetera, et cetera. And this image of America as an asylum for people seeking freedom or seeking greater opportunity or seeking something else from other parts of the world, is, it's been there since the very beginning. Tom Paine laid this out in Common Sense in 1776. Yet, of course, the other side of the story is there have been many outbreaks of strong anti-immigrant sentiment in American history. Xenophobia, you might call it. The 1790s, which uh, led to, in 1798, the passage of the Alien Act, trying to restrict aliens, immigrants, from coming in and giving the government the right to kick out immigrants they didn't like. Um, the 1850s, which we'll talk about in a minute, the World War I period, and then immediately after, which led to the massive restriction of immigration in the 1924 uh, immigration law. And I do not need to tell you that immigration is a very controversial and volatile issue in American politics as we speak. It's, I mean, it's, they're, they're debating right now in Washington, D.C., what to do about immigrants non-documented immigrants or illegal immigrants that go are here, their children, what kind of immigration policies should we have, et cetera, et cetera. Immigrants have often been a target of hostility of one form or another by ver at various points, various groups, et cetera. So it's not simple enough to just say we're a nation of immigrants because that is a very, um, you know, that, can, that produces a lot of tension in our history as well. Um, you know, lying beneath this is the fundamental question, who is an American? Or who is, you know, um, th back in 1780, or the 1780s, one of the great myth makers of that era, St. John uh, Crevacor, a Frenchman who had come to live here, wrote, he wrote a book about America, and he, he raised this question, who is an American? And he answered, the American is a European, is, is the descendant of Europeans. He is an Englishman, a Frenchman, a Dutchman, a, a, a German, et cetera, et cetera. And, this, and he put together this idea of America as a melting pot. Now, of course, Crevacor, who did Crevacor leave out in what I just discussed with you? 20% of the population were people from Africa. 20% of the, the highest in our history, the highest percentage of black people in our history, and yet they were invisible to Crevacor. They did not count as Americans. Um, nor did Native Americans figure in the picture that he is, that he is painting there. Um, and that tension about who is visible and who is present and who should be present is, it's not only typical of America, it's typical of almost every country which tries to define itself as to who is a, because as um, the political scientist Benedict Anderson wrote very famously years ago, a nation is not just a physical place, it's an imagined community. That phrase was, you know, has been used many times since Anderson, an imagined community. People have a mental picture of who is supposed to be part of that nation. Now, Upstairs here in the political science department somewhere, they have guys and gals poking around on this question, and they, uh, the political scientists uh, often claim there are two concepts, two basic concepts of citizenship, of identity, of belonging. One is what they call ethnic, which often has a religious or other kind of, but a, a certain people, a certain kind of people are the nation. Often taken as typical of this is Germany, the Volk, the people. You can be the descendant of a German whose ancestors hundreds of years ago moved out of Germany and yet you're still a German. You can come back and be a citizen immediately in Germany because you're part of that. It's a community of descent, not descent, controversy, descent, D-E-S, descent, um, a legacy. Whereas if you are born in Germany today, as the children of, let us say, Turkish workers who moved to Germany 20, 30 years ago, you're not a German. You have to go through a process of becoming a German even though you are born there. So now the other side, and of course there are many countries which 
identify either as a religious group is the essential nation or an ethnic group or a language group, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then there is the other kind of nationalism, which is called civic nationalism. Civic nationalism, which basically says, no, it, it's just a set of ideals. Anybody can be a member of the nation. It doesn't matter what your origin, what your religion, what your race, nothing. What matters is you sort of identify with the institutions of the nation. France is often seen as that. You can be a French, doesn't matter where you're from, if you're sort of part of the French heritage, you know French, you've learned, you know about the French Revolution or whatever it is, liberté, égalité, fraternité, you believe in all that, you're French. Doesn't matter if you're African or Asian or what. Um, the United States is often seen, and today, in large measure is an example of civic nationalism. Ever since the Reconstruction era, the 14th Amendment, anybody born in the United States is a citizen. What we call birthright citizenship. Doesn't matter what your ancestor, where they came from, who they are, anybody can be an American, right? Now, this is still controversial. I hate to invoke the Super Bowl, but uh, there was this ad on the, I think Coca-Cola, right, had this ad at the, on the Super Bowl of all these different groups, different racial groups, ethnic groups, singing America the Beautiful or something like that in four or five different languages to show the great diversity and, you know, of America. And the internet lit up with all sorts of hostile comments. Well, these people aren't really Americans. Well, they're not even speaking English, et cetera, et cetera, you know. So uh, this is still a controversial idea, let's just put it that way. But the basic fact is, at least before the Civil War, our, and it, to some extent even continuing, our concepts of nationhood have actually been a combination of both ethnic and civic. Um, I, that's, Trevor is an I example of that. For example, black people, people from Africa, let us say, could not become naturalized citizens until 1870. In other words, before the Civil War, only white people could, could immigrate and become citizens. That's what the law, the basic naturalization law of 1790, white people are allowed to immigrate and become. So the very nation that declared itself an asylum for mankind eliminated a majority of mankind right at the beginning. The non-white majority of mankind could not share in this promise of America. Blacks were allowed to become naturalized, I'm not talking about born here, naturalized immigrant citizens in 1870. People from Asia could not become naturalized citizens of the United States until the, 18, uh, the 1940s and 1950s, not that long ago. So there's always been a sort of a, um, some kind of racial characterization of American citizenship as well as this more uh, civic one. But all right, so these, but maybe for our purposes, nativism emerges as a political force only at a few time periods in American history, one of which is the 1850s. Why? Why does nativism, hostility to immigrants, become a major political force, not just a sentiment or prejudice um, in this period? And I think there are at least three reasons, one of which is an unprecedented flood of immigrants into the country in the 1840s and 1850s, for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. Second of all, the, um, the hostility was not just to immigrants, or in fact, maybe shouldn't even be described as hostility to immigrants at all. It's particularly hostility to Catholic immigrants, and of course, particularly Irish immigrants. Anti-Catholicism, the notion that American institutions were under some kind of threat from the Catholic Church, was, became more and more agitated as the large numbers of Irish, and indeed German Catholic, immigrants entered the country. And thirdly, the crack up of the political system, which we began to see last time. In other words, there's a major political vacuum into which nativist politics can, can, um, can enter. 